So, as Frank said, we are going to continue in our study on, uh, through the book of Hebrews. Uh, going to finish up chapter 2 today. Uh, we began on that last time, and so we ended with verse 13. So I'm going to back up, and I'm going to go over verses 12 and 13 again, just to get some continuity going there, and because there's not all that much left of the chapter, and it gives me a little more to talk about, you know. But no, that's not it. I don't just need to stand up here and talk. I could go to get lunch. That'd be fine. You know, I'm getting giggles and gla All right, so. Uh, but uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, pick up there with me and follow along. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. So the he in this, we got to remember, he is referring to Jesus, okay? But he is also, these Psalms are also speaking of God the Father saying to this Messiah person, these things. See, it's both. Both are, are happening here. Both, Messiah would say these things to God the Father and would say, uh, here I am and the children God has given me. And that is a, that per particular statement is prophetic of the second coming. So here I am and the children God has given me. So that's when the saints return with Christ to the earth. Okay. Uh, and that's prophetic of that as well. But back here, when he says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. To my brothers and sisters, Jesus is the humanity, is God in the flesh, right? So he now has brothers and sisters, right? Because he's human, he's man, he's fully man, fully God and fully man, before, he didn't have brothers and sisters, right? God doesn't have brothers and sisters in, the, in that sense of the word. But in his humanity, after the advent of putting on a skin suit, right, and becoming a human, in that, now he has brothers and sisters. They, all, all of the mankind, really, are his brothers and sisters, but more specifically, um, he's really referring to those who would be around him, who would follow him, who would pay attention and, and be his followers. So um, he is referring to Christ, your name, referring to God the Father, uh, his brothers and sisters and children of God has given me are all referring to those who believe in him and that he has given eternal life to because of their faith in him. And we have become, because of that faith in Him, God grants us sons, uh, adoption as sons and daughters. So all of this theology, this New Testament, New Covenant theology is coming out in this book of Hebrews. Uh, you know, the, the book of Romans was obviously written by Paul to the Christians in Rome and giving them a primer on New Testament theology, right, on Christology and the fulfillment of the Messiah coming into the world. But the Hebrew people, because they weren't reading stuff that came from Paul, they didn't get all of that. So here comes the book of Hebrews, written specifically to them, unsigned, but carrying all of this deep theology with it. So it's, it's very, very good here. Um, these verses are quotes from the Psalms, as I said previously in the other ones, and also Isaiah here. But they were prophetic of the Messiah because he was made like us. He can sing the praises of God and attest to having trusted in the Father because he became human. Um, prior to becoming human, how could he trust in the Father? He was, you know, uh, they were one. I mean, the, the Father and the expression of God and the Spirit of God were one God, you know, three in one. Yeah, anyway, I know it's, it's difficult. Getting your head wrapped around the things of God sometimes is very difficult. I mean, well, the, the Trinity is just the start of it. Getting your head wrapped around uh, no time is another one. How do, you, how do you just get your head around something where time just doesn't exist? It always is, always was, and there's no 
Someday, it's all now to God. It's all now. And that is just too hard for us to even imagine. Because we think everything had a beginning, and everything proceeded over time, linear. But He made time. That's one of the, the physical properties that He created, like all the rest. So He's not subject to it. Anyway, and once we can at least get our heads in that mode, to at least understand He is not subject to time, He created it, then it makes a lot of other things easier to take in the Bible. And a lot of other things that, that are said about God are easier to understand once we get that thing about time wrapped, wrapped around us, you know. But in, anyway, all right, so now today, now verse 14 and 15, let's go there. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power over death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So if I were to give you a pop quiz right now and say, inside of time, in our linear time, those of us who, though all of God's creation, we're subject to time, right? Within that, who up until the cross had the power over life and death, or power over death? Let's just say that. Right here it says, the devil. The devil had the power over death. But does he now? Question two, after post-cross, does the devil hold the power of death? Trick question, because for those who have not accepted Christ, yeah, he still does. Okay, and it doesn't mean that not every, that God can control everything and can intervene. That's true. He can and has, and it's recorded in Scripture. But generally speaking, uh, the devil was given that that right. He, he, he earned it, actually. He, he earned that right to have the power over death by tricking us humans into following Him and, and following after Him and giving up what we first knew instead. So, you know, there we get, get into deep theology again, but, you know, that's the truth of the matter. Now, uh, Jesus became a man so that a man could break free from the power of sin and death. You get that? I mean, God could do it. God was superior to it anyway. An angel, eh, you know, angel, they don't die. They're eternal beings. And so you can't kill an angel, really. You know, that's, that's what it comes down to. You can't kill an angel. So an angel really couldn't fulfill it either. For someone to break through the power of death, they had to be someone that it had something over, Right? Now, you can get into, we've, I've sat around the fire sometimes, uh, in, in, there's this great lodge that we've gone to down at Silver Spur many times, and uh, I've sat around that fireplace out there in the lodge late at night with other pastors, hanging out in there and having some discussions sometimes, and it's kind of funny because we'll get into some of this deep theology in there just because it just... just Makes you feel good like you're waxing philosophical or something like that. Makes you feel like you're C.S. Lewis or someone like, you know, someone like that just to sit in there and say, you know, have you ever thought about, and you could just imagine that big old stogie sitting in there talking with J.R. Rawlings or J.K. or whatever, the, his buddy that wrote the Lord of the Rings that they hung out together, C.S. Lewis and him, you know, and, and they, would, they would sit down there and they would wax philosophical, and they would talk about theology, and they would talk about, and so it's kind of like that, you know, we're sitting there thinking, have you ever thought about the fact that Scripture says that death comes into the world because of sin, right? That Scripture says that. Death is the result of sin, at the wage of sin is death, right? Okay. So, if there was no sin, death could not come. Now, if you could take death and personify, are you guys still following me? You're sitting around the table with C.S. Lewis right now, right? All right. So, uh, you're sitting there. If 
you can personify death. You know, I don't know, has it got a hood on and a big sickle, you know, and everything like they, you know, in all the movies? I don't know, whatever, maybe. Personify death. Death comes, right? Comes after somebody. Oh, there's these guys hanging on the cross down here, right? There's three of them. Well, I'm going to go after them. It's time to reap this harvest. Get a little carried away taking the one that was sinless, didn't he? Death had no, 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 uh, jurisdiction over the one who did not have sin. So not only did he allow it to happen, quietly sit there and allow himself to experience death, but death is caught on a technicality because it did not have jurisdiction over him because he was without sin. He was taking all of our sin to the cross and it's all nailed there and, it, and he's paying for it but death didn't know that's what was happening. See, he's more clever than death. And the one who had power over death had the reins over death, who's the devil. His creator is way more powerful and way more clever, right? So he goes ahead with it, allows himself to be put to death, and he's got him. Now I just beat you. I'm going to get this whole thing thrown out of court on a technicality. Because you had no jurisdiction and you just overstepped your bounds. So guess who's got control now? Right? Now, if I put this little story into something that makes you feel like you sat around with J.R.R. Tolkien and uh, C.S. Lewis uh, uh, around sitting about talking about deep stuff, right? Now, I don't know if that enriched your life at all today. Maybe that and two bucks will still buy you a half a cup of coffee. Don't know. But anyway, I hope, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I did. Death comes for sin. Without sin, there would be no death because death is the wage of sin. So if a sinless man was put to death, death itself and the devil who uh, held the power of death are caught in a technicality of unjust action. Okay? By dying, though sinless, he broke the power over sin and the devil. And by resurrecting, he broke the power over death. Couldn't hold him. So he broke that power as well because now he had the power because of the technicality, right? You see all of the, the circle that goes around. So we, know, we no longer have to fear death but can see it as a doorway to resurrection day, right? You know, I, I've, I've given you my theory before on the time warp thing, right? Wormholes in time and all of that, you know, because God's in control of all that sort of stuff. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sci-fi guy. I like those movies where, you know, you step through the Stargate and you go somewhere else. Or you, the other one where you step through a time warp and you're in a different time setting, right? I really like those because I'd like to do that. I think it'd be cool. Go back and see some people in history, wouldn't you? I mean, everybody'd like to do that, right? You know, be there just at the right time to buy stock in Amazon, you know, or, or Xerox, or, you know, I mean, hey, <laughs> right? Uh, but, no, you know, uh, if, if everyone who is resurrected is resurrected at the same time, Paul gave us a lesson on that, remember? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we get a little bit of a lesson on the way things are going to happen on the day of the rapture and the resurrection. Okay? Same day. It's the same event. He tells us that. That the resurrection of the saints and the rapture occurred at the same event. We who are alive and remain at the coming of him for his saints will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Didn't say that he landed. He does a flyover, right? On that trip. That's not the second coming. It's the harvesting of his saints. He comes, does a flyover, and we are lifted up and meet him in the air, but we do not precede those who have died, it says, for the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who remain will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. So the resurrection of the saints who have died and the rapture of the living saints 
is it the same day? It's all at the same time. What's been going on all this time? Oh, I mean, the resurrection of the saints goes back a, quite a long time in history. When did the first Christian die? Even if you're not going to take the uh, Old Testament saints into account, because I kind of think that they're in, included in that, that as well, the ones that were truly saved by their faith in God's provision and looked forward to it, I think that they'll be there too, personally. Um, not going to get into the proof of that today, but... Um, Anyway, at least you would say that at least everyone in the Christian era are those in Christ, right? Everyone who has died after placing their faith in Christ, from the first martyred saint to the ones that just died of, of getting old. You know, John died of getting old. He wasn't martyred. He was only one of the 12 that wasn't killed unnaturally. And they tried to kill him. <laughs> it just didn't work. And then he, he died of old age after that. But of, of all of them, they, from the very first one on, what have they been doing? Sitting there in the, in the grave, dead, waiting, going, is it time yet? Is it time yet? Is there some soul sleep thing that's going on? Is there some sort of holding pattern that they're in, flying around? You know, is there something like that? There, everybody has got a theory on that. All kinds of people have theorized of, What's going on with the souls of those who are in Christ during this time? Here's mine, in case you care. God's in charge of time, right? God is in charge of time, and my theory is death is like a door. Open that door, step across that threshold, and it's that day. I believe, this is my belief, that when I step across that or get lifted up off my ATV riding along and, you know, up into the air, uh, whatever happens on that day, I'm going to look across and there's my grandmother stepping across that threshold saying, what's going on? And I could just see her face looking around, what's going on? Hey, and there's grandpa too. There's her parents. See, all of the saints, the those who have trusted Christ with their faith in him through life, will all step across that threshold instantaneously, even though on this side of the door, they all went through at different periods of time, okay? But that door is a time wormhole, right? Okay, you don't have to believe it. I'm not going to test you on this and give you a failing grade if you disagree. That's fine. But doesn't it make a lot of sense? And doesn't it put your mind at rest to think of it that way? To me, with the Holy Spirit in me, I, I go, you know, I can, I can live with that theory. I get it. I can understand. And maybe I have to be a sci-fi person that likes sci-fi movies to really enjoy that theory. But I am, so it works for me, you know. But hopefully it works for you too, because we'll step across that and Audie Murphy's going to be right there too. So different movies, you like a different type of movie? John Wayne will probably be right there with him. I know Ronald Reagan's going to be right there, right? That man was a believer. He was a staunch believer. Anyway, C.S. Lewis will be right over there smoking that big stogie. Hey, been waiting for you. Glad you're here. I got a new book I'm thinking about right now. I've read most of your other ones, but okay. All right, so death comes for sin, came for Jesus, got him, took him, and he had no, they, it had no reason to take him. He got it. He experienced it. He beat death, and it had to be a human to do that, so he became a human so that he could go through this whole process. See, why did Messiah have to die? If you're a Hebrew person, if you've been brought up in Judaism, you're saying, well, Messiah is going to come in like the old uh, deliverers of the judges of the Old Testament era, and he's going to ride in and he's going to whip the Romans and set us free, right? That's what they were wanting. That's what they were hoping for. And sure, there is, there is a prophetic verses in the scriptures talking about Messiah putting all of his enemies away, right? But that was a different event. That's a different event. First, he came to set the captives free. First, he came to pay for sin, make the restitution or the propitiation for sin, provide for us what we needed to clothe ourselves with his righteousness instead of ours, 
right? He came to do that first. Now, if you're of the Jewish mindset, you're upset because you don't want that guy who died to be Messiah because Messiah should be coming back and setting things right and putting Israel in its rightful place in the world again. There's so much pride in their national pride. We should be ruling the world, not Rome. We should, those dogs, that's what they thought of Romans, dogs. In fact, many Jewish people thought of everyone that wasn't Jewish as a dog, right? Talk about your racial discrimination. That group of people back in those days, they really believed they were it. So now, write to them and say, this had to be done. He had to come and he had to be one of you because he's setting first free his nation Israel, first came to save them, but also the Gentiles, you see? So he had to come and do that first, reasoning with them why Messiah had to die. And taking all those scriptures and bringing them up is what the writer, I believe the apostle Paul here, uh, was doing in this letter, just as he did in all the ones that he did sign. And, and when he would go into a new town, to make uh, his headway in that new town, he'd usually go find a synagogue and he would walk in on Saturday whenever they were ready to read the book and they would see his robe, recognize the stripes on it or whatever as that he came from Jerusalem and, uh, and he's a teacher. He's got all of the right stripes on his shawl and all that kind of stuff and they would say, brother, do you have some word from Jerusalem for us? And he'd have an opportunity to speak. And he would start reasoning from Scripture that Messiah had to die. You see, Paul did that. Everywhere he went, when he would go into a community that didn't have Christianity there first, that's the way he broke in. He'd find the Jewish settlement there somewhere, if there was one. If there wasn't, then he just did his other things, you know. But that's what he did. And here in this letter, the case is being made. Messiah had to die. He had to come and be one of us, and he had to go to the cross, and he had to die, and he caught it on a technicality and all these other things that I've taught to you today. So now let's go into verses 16 to 18. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. See, it's not the angels here, he says. It's not the angels who needed to be set free, but humans. It's Abraham's descendants, speaking to the Hebrew people, they would see themselves as the descendants of Abraham. In other of, of Paul's writings, he says, but actually, the true descendants of Abraham are any, anyone who belongs to the family of faith. Those who have faith, that's the true descendant of Abraham, whether you're his blood or not. You know, so he's kind of hitting both here, right? Because we really are kind of included in that descendants of Abraham here too. Uh, those of us who are not Jewish descendants or ancestry. So um, it, it's first the, those Abraham's descendants that he came to free. Later in this letter, we'll learn that Abraham's descendants does not. Okay, yeah, it's, I already said that. But it's later in this letter we'll even cover that, that where he'll say Abraham's descendants are those who are by faith um, trust in God. Made like us means that he was fully human in every way. Okay, so this is speaking to his humanity. He's made like us. This verse refutes any notion that Jesus was an angel. There are some cults out there that, that take away his humanity. Some cults take away his deity. And some cults take away both. And to say he's an angel takes away both. Because an angel's not God. And an angel's not a human. So if you call him an angel, then you just take, you've taken all those things away from him. And you've destroyed New Testament theology. So you got to throw the New Testament away if you're that cult. You know, changing one or two words in their version of the New Testament isn't enough. Because the whole story of the New Testament flies in their face. It's just, it's wrong to try to take his deity away or his humanity away and say that he wasn't even human. Because 
Scripture says he was. So, because he suffered, oh, uh, the high priest thing, that was another one. In order to atone for our sin, under the law, prior to the cross, prior to fulfilling the law, the law was still in effect. It was still God's way, his plan. In order to atone for sin for mankind, he had to fill the role of the high priest, right? So this is, it's kind of strange because the sacrifice became the priest and sacrificed himself, right? But it was the only sacrifice that was worthy to do it once and for all. So he was our high priest, and there's more, we'll get into that more on too, about him being our high priest and our king. So, you know, which that's not, that wasn't supposed to happen in Judaism either. You're either of the kingly uh, royalty or of the priestly set, you couldn't be both. You know, two different tribes. The, the tribe of Judah had the scepter, uh, the king, the royalty, and the Levites were the priests. And more, more specifically, the sons of Aaron within the Levites, uh, they, they were the priests. So anyway, uh, it's funny that Jesus filled all those roles. And there, there, there was another case in the Old Testament of someone who was not um, actually really a priest going in and doing priest work. And, and making atonement for, you know, a sacrifice for people. So it, 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 was, it wasn't something God wouldn't accept. It was something that the Jews normally didn't accept. You see what I'm saying? Um, so anyway, made like us means that he was fully human in every way. In order to atone for sin, he filled the role of high priest, which necessitated him being human because an angel couldn't be the high priest, you know. Because he suffered and endured temptations, he can help us in suffering and temptations because he's done it. He's been there. He could say to you, I've been there, done that. I, I, I understand. He didn't sin. And mostly that's why we have such trouble with it is because we do. Um, but he still suffered the temptation and suffered physically as well. He can identify with our struggles because he struggled. So ask yourself, do, do, do you suffer in this life? I, you know, if I was going to ask for a show of hands, I think we'd all have our hand in the air, right? Is there anyone that doesn't suffer? Yeah. Um, so if you suffer in this life, doesn't it help you to know that the one who is calling you to imitate him and to be set apart as he is set apart, doesn't it help you to know that the one who is calling you to that, he knows what you're going through because he suffered too? It's a little help. I mean, it's, it's almost kind of a morbid kind of a thing, actually, that I'm, I'm comforted by someone else's suffering. But, you know, because it's not that I want someone else to have to suffer, but I, I do receive comfort from someone who's been there and done that. I, it's something that's wired into us in our humanity. Uh, it does, it works for us, right? So, he was tempted in every way. He was suffered. He was put under the butter, burden. He stood up under the burden. He endured and was perfect where we are not. But his love covers us and his blood takes away our guilt. His righteousness is loaned to us. And we can put it on. And that goes back to his parable of the banquet or the wedding banquet and the robes where the king sent out the robes for everyone to wear. And those who came wearing their own garments were thrown out. Okay. That's talking about our righteousness. Our righteousness doesn't cover us. Only his will. And he sent it to us. We have to put that on. Is your faith in his work or is your faith in your work? My work's worthless. <laughs> My work is garbage, filthy rags, the Bible says, especially that which was of the flesh. Now, if the Holy Spirit motivated me and empowered me to do something I did it, well, then that was good work, but I can't take credit for it either. It was the Holy Spirit working, right? See, so anything that I could take credit for, worthless, worthless. So I can't make my own righteousness, garbage. So... 
it does help. He endured it all. He, he loans that to us. So not only does he help us, but he heals our biggest disease. He healed the biggest thing wrong with us. The rest of the things we can live with, so to speak, even if they do kill us, we could still live with it because it's that what we needed was that beyond death's door. We needed to be able to step across that threshold into eternity on resurrection day and be a part of that crowd, right? So, aren't you looking forward to that? Hey, no more suffering, no more pain. Whew. That'd be great. It's like a can't wait, can't wait, can't wait kind of thing, right? All right, well, let's close that there because chapter 3 is awaiting. And we'll go there next. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, for teaching us, for showing us the truth, for giving us clarity and understanding. Lord, I'm also thankful for the fact that you protect us and you guide us and you direct us. We need those, Lord. We need that protection in this time, in this age, and, and, and the guidance and direction too, because we don't know how to navigate these waters. But you do, and we need your, your help with that. So we thank you for it. We're grateful. We look forward to all the provision that you will provide. And all these things we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.